Um, well, never mind that then. C G Q plus. All right, so uh, on this episode, we're going to get back on our timeline after deviating last week by talking about the Garbage Pail Kids. But uh, before we get started, I have a couple other things I wanted to just quickly touch on. First of all, I know you guys like it when I record these videos in 4K and upload them in 4K, but uh, I mean, I have a pretty good computer. I don't know, either the computer is just not up to the task or I'm just impatient because I'm accustomed to doing everything in 1080p, but... You know, it's about 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday right now. And uh, if I want this video to come out in 4K, it's not going to come out until tomorrow because it takes forever for the computer uh, to render it. And then it's a huge file that I have to upload and, and uh, whatever. And then I also noticed last time, you know, I thought it would be cool having the TV in the background, like playing a game on it. But then I noticed that the darker it got in here because the sun was going down, the more that was like wreaking havoc on uh, the camera's auto exposure and white balance and uh, it just turned into a real headache so and then you'll notice we have kind of a different background today just because i took the camera and turned it a little bit uh, just to take advantage of the light and then before we start talking about today's topics uh, i just got a couple of packages this month in the mail that i just wanted to kind of quickly show just to give you know uh, proper thanks to the people that uh took the time and money to send stuff into the show. So the first package came from a guy named Paul, who's a longtime viewer of both shows. And uh, he sent me some magazines, which of course uh, I love. He sent me four issues of the official US PlayStation magazine. I never got official US PlayStation magazine back in the day. I was a PSM person. So uh, that, that was my magazine of choice. And uh, no real reason I didn't have anything against this magazine. It was just, I think I had a subscription to PSM, and so I just didn't want to spend money on a second magazine. Uh, so the four issues we have here, Volume 1, Issue 5, from February of 98. And that one's got uh, the original Dead or Alive on the cover. I uh, never played Dead or Alive back then, uh, just because I wasn't really into fighting games that much. Although I did play Dead or Alive uh, 2. Was that Dead or Alive 2? on the Dreamcast, whichever one was like a really early release for the Dreamcast. I remember playing that one. Uh, second, we've got November 98, uh, it's Volume 2, Issue 2, and uh, it's got, you know, Lara Croft on the cover. And what I think is funny about that, this is for Tomb Raider 3, it says Tomb Raider 3 Exposed, Learn All the Dirty Details, is there was just this constant thing back then about, the, is there some cheat code, is there some way to see Lara Croft naked? which I always thought was kind of stupid. Uh, and then here they've got over 50 games explored in exciting detail. This is a November issue, right? So it's a little bit thicker because uh, this was sort of like the Christmas issue. And um, uh, yeah, there's a poster in here. That's kind of cool. Um, yeah, anyway, that's a cool one. Next, we've got Volume 2, Issue 4 from January of 99. And uh, that has Gex Deep Cover Gecko on the cover. And uh, they don't say too much of what else is in there. But uh, never played Gex on the PlayStation. I played the original Gex for the 3DO, but I didn't have a 3DO back then. I mean, I just played it later on. And then lastly here we have Volume 2, Issue 1. I should have put these in order. Sorry, I didn't. From uh, October of 98. And that has uh, Spyro or Spiro the Dragon. I always said Spyro, but some people say Spiro. Uh, on the front. Another game, uh, I can't say I played this one back then just because it, maybe it seemed a little bit too kiddy for me, but um, that's funny. It says There's a thing here. It says, what does ESPN know about video games? And then it's got Kenny Main and Dan Patrick uh, both dressed up like, you know, in traditional stereotypical Mexican car. I just thought it was funny. Um, anyway, yeah, I really haven't had much of a chance to give these a flick through yet. Uh, it was kind of funny, he sent these in a box where he had to roll them all up, and so when I took them out of the box, they kind of wanted to stay rolled up. And I just stuck them under a stack of other magazines for a while, and now they're perfectly flat again, so that's cool. But, um, now, I think I said when I did the read-through of PSM issue number one, which was maybe like the second magazine read-through I ever did, I just made that up, so it might be wrong, um... I believe I said that that was the first video game magazine that I had ever bought. Like, you know, well, certainly in, during the, the my 
years with the PlayStation, but I think period, that was the first game magazine I ever bought because I never bought video game magazines, uh, you know, back in like the 8 and 16 video because I didn't have money for that. I did like to get, I picked up magazines when I was into PC gaming in the early 90s, but mostly I would pick up Computer Shopper instead, which is kind of a weird choice. But anyway, I had always thought it was PSM that was my first magazine until I saw these two issues that he um, included, and it kind of jogged my memory a little bit. Uh, these are two issues, both from 98, consecutive issues, May and June, of PS Extreme, which was um, a lesser known or, or less popular PlayStation magazine, at least where I live. I don't know if it was maybe more popular in other places. Uh, on one issue, we have Spiro or Spyro the Dragon again, and on the other issue, we have a game called Road Trip. And when I saw these, I thought, oh, it was a copy of PS Extreme that I had purchased that I don't have anymore, but I was wrong. Um, because what happened, I don't have that magazine anymore, but that magazine came with a little hint book, and that was actually why I bought the magazine. And I still have the hint book, and it's right, it's right here. And it was because, you know, we'll get to this in more detail later, but when I bought my PlayStation uh, in June of 97, the game that I bought with it was this game called Codename Tenka, a very forgettable first-person shooter. And uh, it came, so the magazine that I ended up buying, which would have been right around the same time, I probably picked it up at the grocery store, it came with this little hint book that uh, says huge walkthrough for Tenka. Well, it can't be that big of a walkthrough because this is a pretty tiny little uh, guidebook. But that's why I bought it. And so I think I ended up just kind of not needing the magazine anymore. I mean, back then I wasn't really like stockpiling magazines. So uh, I threw the magazine out and I kept that. But so this is from a magazine called PlayStation Power, which I thought was only from the UK, but um, obviously not because uh, I have this. It says here on the back, available only as a free gift with issue 14 of PlayStation Power. So issue 14 of PlayStation Power uh, must have been the first game magazine that I ever bought. It would be cool to get a copy of that. But So anyway, I got those six magazines from Paul, which uh, are greatly appreciated. Thank you, sir. And then uh, we just have one other thing, and, and this one kind of blew me away a little bit. So just to give a little bit of quick backstory in case anybody didn't see that episode, back in, I think it was episode two of Flashback when I was talking about uh, when I got my uh, Nintendo. You know, my dad surprised me and got me the Nintendo. And I just sort of told that little, you know, not even a story, a little anecdote about how Luigi reminds me of my dad because we would play Super Mario Brothers two-player and I was always Mario and he was always Luigi. And so just somehow for me, Luigi always reminds me of my dad. Now, what I didn't say then, and you know, I'll, I'll just say now to add a little extra detail, uh, my dad, you know, my, my grandparents on my dad's side both immigrated to the United States from Sicily. So my dad was like full-blooded you know, full-blooded Sicilian or whatever, and he, he looked like it. You know, he had, like, the jet black hair and, you know, pretty dark complexion. And uh, when I was growing up, he always had a beard and a mustache like I do now. But as he got older, his beard started turning gray. I mean, much as mine is now, but uh, mine's going gray faster than his was because uh, uh, this wouldn't have been until he was about 50 that he shaved his beard off. And I'm only 40, and mine's not looking so hot. So, um... He shaved his beard off and all he had was a mustache. So he was like this, you know, a little bit on the shorter side, you know, Italian guy with jet black hair and a mustache. And he just kind of looked the part, you know. So I think that's that just adds to why, you know, Luigi reminds me of my dad. But so anyway, uh, so I got this gift from a guy named Michael. I don't want to give out last name. So his name is Michael and he reached out to me on Facebook and uh, just mentioned, you know, keep an eye on the CGQ PO box because you got something coming. And what he sent me was, and I, I had never heard of these things, uh, it's Pixel Pals. Uh, we can get closer than that, right? Pixel Pals. And uh, it's from Super Mario Brothers 3 here. And then um, I haven't taken it out of the box yet because we'll do it right now, but it even says like I light up on there. And obviously it's Luigi. And I thought, I looked at that and I was like, wow, that's really cool, you know? But then he included this note. And uh, he said, so you will always be reminded of your dad. My mom tried to play GT6, Gran Turismo 6, with me, her 30-something son. Now past, I'll never get rid of that game or her ghost car and time trials. 
I hope this will bring you as much joy as a GT6 save file. And, I mean, I don't even know what to say about, you know, that that's an exceptionally thoughtful thing uh, to give to somebody. And, um, you know, stuff like this is why I really love having this channel and making these videos is, you know, so many of you guys, you know, you leave comments or whatever and talk about how, you know, hearing me tell these stories, you know, takes you back to your own childhood and whatnot, you know, because when I started this channel, I thought, well, who's going to watch this, right? I'm just going to talk about, you know, my childhood or whatever. But um, the fact that it has seems to be making a connection with so many people is really cool. And to, to get something like this, especially with that attached note, is is just really awesome. And it, it's like I said, it's an incredibly thoughtful thing. And, um, you know, I lost my dad when I was 14. But, you know, obviously, if your mom was playing Gran Turismo 6 with you, then you lost her a lot more recently. So I'm um, sorry to hear that. And, uh, you know, I hope you're doing okay. But, um, so I want to just take this out and we'll check it out real quick. Like I said, I, I had never heard of these things, so I'm not exactly sure how it works. I don't know if it takes, oh good, it just takes batteries. Uh, I happen to have some batteries right behind me. So here's, uh, here's Luigi there. It's pretty neat. And uh, there's just a little compartment back here for batteries. And if you will bear with me, I have some Enna loops right behind me. So we're gonna pop these in and triple A's. See, I only had two triple A's, so that's good. All right, so fire them up. I don't know how well we're gonna be able to see anything with the, with the window right there. Yeah, all it does is just look bright on the camera. So you'll just have to trust me that in person, uh, this looks pretty cool. So um, I think what I'm gonna end up doing is I'm gonna put Luigi on the uh, shelf back here with my Nintendo games. So again, thank you very much, uh, Michael. This is uh, this is very thoughtful, and I'm gonna hang on to your note. Uh, you know, I've always I hang on to everything everybody sends me, like even the, even the notes and whatnot. So that's just gonna go in the box with that. But um, so thank you very much. All right, when we left off. I was leaving my dad's house and coming back to my mom's house. And you know, after I told that story and uploaded it and was reading some of the comments, it kind of started to make me feel a little bit weird because I kind of was feeling like, well, did I, did I share too much? Like, was that too personal? And uh, you know, cause some of the comments were like, wow, this must be like, you know, therapeutic for you or, or and, and it's really not. That's, not, that's not why I did it. As I said, when I was a kid, I really wanted to go live with my mom. Like that's what I really wanted to make me happy. And so when it finally did, it was like a huge deal. And it's like, how do I convey that to you um, without either just telling you what happened or leaving you to make your own inferences about what happened? And that's kind of what I didn't want is just like, you can't just throw something out there like, yeah, I got to go live back with my mom again. Thank God, that's what I wanted. You know, I was so unhappy being with my dad. And it's like, well, why? And I just want to be clear, it wasn't, because of anything my dad does, it wasn't, or did, it wasn't because of my dad at all. And in fact, like it's a source of guilt for me that, you know, I hope my dad understood that it wasn't about him because of course he passed away a few years later. Uh, so that's all that was really about. Uh, so anyway, it was a couple weeks before school started. Like I said, I had to just load up whatever few belongings I had that I could load up into uh, my mom's friend's truck because as I said, she just coincidentally happened to be there and go home. And it was basically clothing, my Nintendo, and my, my keyboard, my little Casio keyboard. Which is funny because I don't really remember ever playing that again after I left. Uh, even though I wanted it so bad for Christmas the year that I got it. But uh, anyhow, so I go home and I still have a couple weeks of my summer vacation left. And just to kind of paint a little bit of a picture of how much different life was at my mom's house versus my dad's house. One of the reasons that I'm actually grateful for the time I got to spend with my dad and my stepmom is that it gave me the experience of living as part of a standard American middle-class nuclear family, right? It was like a mom, a dad, and then a son and a daughter. And I got to have, you know, the closest thing to a normal childhood experience that I was ever gonna get. 
and uh, which is not to say that anything else was bad, but it was just um, living at my mom's house was a lot different, but it was actually in a good way. But uh, you know, it's nice to be able to see both sides of the fence. So I go home and my mom is still living in the house where my, my parents lived together before they separated. My dad leaves and my mom wanted to try to hang on to the house. But um, my mom had been a housewife until they separated. You know, my, my mom married my dad when she was very young and this was in the 60s. And you know, she didn't get to go to college or do any of that. You know, she just married my dad, my dad worked, and my mom stayed home. So when they separate fairly suddenly, and he leaves, she's stuck with this house that she has to try to like hang on to. And of course she had to go get a job. But uh, what she ended up doing, which was kind of interesting, is selling half the house to somebody else. And I should say that after I left, my mom actually started going to college. She went to community college and she was really into art. So she was taking all these art classes and becoming kind of part of the art community, not only at that school, but in that city. And uh, she ended up selling the other half of the house to like another artist. And the, the way the house was laid out, it was like there was two bedrooms and a bathroom way on one side of the house. The other two bathrooms in the bedroom were like way on the other side of the house. So that person just kind of like occupied that half of the house and they were like happy. It was, a, it was just a much different experience being around like those kind of people. Like we had like parties at the house like every weekend. And I don't mean like crazy like debaucherous playboy parties but just there were like always people over at the house and we had a pool in the backyard so people were coming and getting in the pool uh every monday night my mom would would prepare like what came to just be known as monday night dinners where my mom would just make huge batches of whatever like spaghetti or a couple of tri-tips or whatever and literally anybody that wanted to show up could just show up and you know she would put tables together and I mean there would be you know like 15 20 people at our house all eating dinner sitting around this big long table and uh, it was just like a really cool community atmosphere uh, to be a part of now of course it meant that I came home from school every day when school started to like an empty house because my mom was at work or at school or both but um but it was just so much fun and it doesn't mean that like my you know my mom still you know she was as strict as she needed to be and I mean you know, she was a good mom. It was just, you know, we just had this very different atmosphere that I really enjoyed being a part of. And uh, also, as I mentioned earlier, Jonathan lived right down the street. And then right past his house was our school. So my house, his house, and our school were all on the same street. And uh, so that was cool, too, because it was just, it, it had like this cool, cozy feeling to it where everything was just sort of right there. And... Um, Jonathan used to come over and hang out at my house sometimes, uh, especially on the weekends. Like if there was like a, you know, when people were over and swimming in the pool, like that's when he would come over because it was kind of cool to be there. But other than that, we normally hung out at Jonathan's house. He lived like literally right across from our school. Like it was his house faced an empty field. My neighborhood had a lot of empty fields in it. It was weird. And, uh, but in a cool way, because we used to go play in the fields, you know, but I mean, just an empty untended field with just grass you know, wild grass. And then the other side of that field was our elementary school. And so once school got started, it just became standard that we would walk home together the, you know, 200 feet or whatever. And I would just go to his house with him and I would just stay at his house until I had to leave. So there was this front room that had one of those old school, cause this was like 1988, remember? One of those old school big screen TVs where like the screen itself was like that plastic material where you could like run your fingernail across it and it would sound like a zipper. And it's the kind of TV where you had to be looking straight on at it or the picture looked terrible. That was in like this front room. And that was like, that was Jonathan's dad's TV. Like you did not touch that TV. And Jonathan's dad was like, I was always afraid of him. Like he wasn't like a scary guy. It's not like he, he wouldn't like yell at the kids or beat anybody or anything. Actually, he was super quiet. But it was like the standing rule where as soon as he came home, I had to go. Because like if he came home, that means it was like 5, 5.15, and they were going to start you know, having dinner and whatnot. And so he'd come home, and I'd go out the other door, basically. And uh, so I was always kind of intimidated by him because uh, he didn't really say much. you know, And so he didn't really give you anything to go off of, and I was just kind of... He, he would always wrench on cars. Like he had a shop out in his garage, and he worked in sort of the automotive field. And, uh, but at home, he had a shop, and like he... 
the car that his wife Jonathan's mother drove was like an old like Chevy Caprice classic that he bought probably for next to nothing because he totally like redid it you know like did all the body work and put in new upholstery and like made the thing look nice and new and then when Jonathan's older brother got old enough to get a car um, Jonathan's dad bought an old Chevy Nova like from the 60s and or whenever Nova's came out it couldn't have been any newer than like the early 70s those are cool cars and same thing like he redid the whole thing and it was pretty cool but um anyway so that that tv don't touch that tv but then right next to like the kitchen and like the little dining area and across from the kitchen was this space where there was like the the classic ubiquitous wooden console television that sat on the floor that like everybody had back then and that was basically like the kids tv that Jonathan and his brother would use. And so that that TV uh, sat right there, like kitchen adjacent on the floor, had the Nintendo on top of it. And then they actually had the exact same, uh, that black fake wood NES um, game organizer thing that I have that I showed in a previous video. They had the exact same one sitting on top of the TV. So like we would come home uh, from school and generally we watched cartoons. Uh, this was in the days of like the Disney afternoon. So we would watch like, you know, DuckTales or Tailspin. Um, Tiny Toon Adventures was also on at that time. That was not a Disney afternoon cartoon, but it was on around the same time. Uh, Darkwing Duck, that was a Disney uh, cartoon that was on around that time. So uh, we used to watch those and we'd sit there and maybe do our homework. And then if uh, something came on that, that, you know, we didn't care for, uh, that's when the Nintendo would get turned on. Even when I first got there, like he already had a lot of Nintendo games. Like I would guess he probably got his Nintendo uh, no later than like the fall of 87, if not sooner. Because uh, like I said, he had a pretty good stash of games built up. Now, uh, one of the things that he and his brother would do, it was like just sort of a standing thing where uh, every Christmas he would get two games and his brother would get two games. So they'd get four games every Christmas. And so they would like sit down and like strategize like okay what games are we going to get or whatever like okay i'm going to ask for these two you're going to ask for those two and then uh, uh jonathan's birthday as i think i mentioned previously was like a few weeks or maybe a month after christmas and then of course he would get he would get more games and he also had kind of a job which sounds odd because he was 12 or 11 and uh he would get these paychecks he would get like two or three hundred bucks because he'd only get paid every several months uh based on what he was doing and he would use that and buy a lot more games. I mean, I don't know if his mom made him like stash some of the money away, but you know, he would just take that money and, and go buy two, three, four more Nintendo games. And so the dude just had a pile of Nintendo games. And being my age, he was more into, you know, the same types of games that, uh, that I was, that most people were into, you know, like he had, you know, all of the common, you know, marquee titles. And, uh, you know, I didn't, but uh, subsequently, just because of his game collection, later on in like 96 or 97, when I started getting back into the NES and I wanted to start buying up games, a lot of what I was buying was sort of dictated by what it was that I remember him having back in the day. Because at that point, I wanted to get all those games because I never got to have them back then. At that time, it wasn't about collecting. It was just like, I didn't really get to spend the time I wanted to with those games because they weren't my games. I just played them at his house. But now everything was so cheap that, you know, I was going to like Funko Land or, or I was buying games off of friends who still had their games in a closet somewhere and picking up all this stuff. Now, his brother, I think I may have mentioned somewhere on one of these channels, his brother was more into sports games. His brother was four years older, I think, yeah, four years older than we were. So like when I was in first, second grade, when I was still living there originally, he was like in sixth grade, which is funny because when you're like a first or second grader, a sixth grader almost seems like an adult. It's, you know, like in fact, at, at the school I went to at recess or at lunch, if you were in like fourth, fifth or sixth grade, you were in like a different part of the playground than first, second or third. There was like this white line painted down the blacktop that whichever side of the blacktop you were supposed to be on, you had to stay on that side. And I think it is sort of added to the allure of like, you know, oh, those are like the older kids. And then when you got to be that grade, you know, whatever it was, fourth grade or whatever, where you sort of graduated to the other side of the blacktop, it was kind of a big deal. But so 
because of that, like, you know, I never really spent any time with his brother. He and his brother certainly had a good relationship, but like if I was around and we were playing, like he didn't want to have any part of that. So um, I didn't really interact with him that much, except that I remember that oftentimes we'd want to play Nintendo and we had to kind of wait our turn uh, because he'd be in the middle of a game of like uh, double dribble or bases loaded or hoops were the ones that I remember him having. He was a huge basketball fan. They never had a, a football game, which I thought was kind of odd. But even though the guy lived like seven doors down from me, uh, from me, the same rules applied when I talked about a few episodes ago about game trading versus like just game lending. Generally speaking, Jonathan was not really down to let me take any of his games home. And this was my, you know, we were like best friends. So it's like, that's how strict the rule was in like the kid universe is like, you know, I'd like to let you take one of these games home, but you don't have anything to give me as collateral. So I just can't do it, you know? And uh, so, you know, mostly I was at his house. I'd play a little bit. I spent a lot of time watching him play actually, which I didn't mind because he was a lot better than I was. Like I, I was pretty hopeless at video games, although I did enjoy them but uh, he was really good at them. But uh, at one point around this time, he did let me take a game home. I don't remember if we traded or not. I really, you know, same old song and dance, I really had no games that anybody was interested in borrowing, him included. But, you know, maybe it's possible that I had a game that he wanted to check out. I'm not really sure, but I got to borrow Kid Icarus, and I should have grabbed the cartridge, huh? I can't. The cartridge is down in the basement because I've been playing Kid Icarus. Uh, I apologize for not having it in my hand. Uh, so he had that game. He had already beaten it. And so he, I guess, felt like he was done with it. And maybe it was uh, low risk enough that he didn't mind letting me take it home. So uh, I took it home and Kid Icarus has a special place in my heart because it was the first game that I ever beat. And I should say beat with air quotes because, uh, you know, first of all, the game has a password system, so you, you have that. But I don't remember specifically what the deal was, but I know that if you got a game over and shut the, shut the machine off and turn it back on and use the password, maybe you didn't get to keep all of your power-ups. I don't remember what the deal was, but what I, I specifically remember is not turning off my Nintendo for like three days, which I'm sure anybody that had a Nintendo back then has a similar story with some game where you were trying to leave on the Nintendo because if you turned it off, it was gonna screw up your, your game progress. And you know, obviously the biggest fear you would have is your mom coming by and seeing that little red light on and either thinking, A, oh, he accidentally forgot to turn off his you know, Nintendo machine, or B, knowing you did it on purpose, but thinking that you're wasting electricity and turning it off anyway. So usually what you know you might do just to be sly is you know put something small right in front of that part of the Nintendo sort of blocking the view so that nobody would see the red light. Now obviously you know now thinking back well we could have just opened up the Nintendo and unplugged the LED but when you're a kid you don't you don't know how any of that stuff works. It's just a mystery gray box that plays video games. Um, but anyway so it was like two or three days I seem to remember actually telling my mom, hey, don't turn this off because I'm in the middle of something, and, and I think she was okay with it. But uh, but yeah, that was the first game I beat. Now, when I was a kid, we didn't say that you beat a game. So I'm kind of curious to hear from other people what terminology you used back then, because we used, we would say we passed a game, like P-A-S-S-E-D, passed, which seems like an odd term to use. Like, you, pa oh yeah, I passed it. You know, Double Dragon, I passed it. Which, that sounds odd, but that's what we said. And so at the time it was like, oh yeah, I passed Kid Icarus. Uh, now, of course, I just say you either beat the game or you just finished the game. Um, now, I didn't really have time to play too much Kid Icarus, uh, you know, over the course of the last week or two. I've been playing it for a little bit, for a couple weeks, just trying to jog. It's, it was about jogging my memory more than anything. And uh, the thing with the game is, that was the only time that I really ever played the game that much. And certainly the only time I ever played all the way through it, because what I ended up doing is just sitting down and loading up a, a long play of the game, like from World of Long Plays. And I sat there and I just watched somebody else beat the game. And there wasn't 
a whole lot in the game that was jogging my memory and like, oh yeah, I remember that. There would be little things here or there. Oh, I remember this or yeah, those things or oh yeah, the big spikes or whatever. But overall, like I would see a level and just sort of the whole motif of that level was not something that was like instantly, oh yeah, I remember that, which kind of made me a little bit sad. But, you know, again, I think I probably only had the game for a weekend and then I had to give it back to Jonathan. And then I didn't get it again until, you know, probably 10 years later. And at that point, I had enough games that I really didn't need to go back and sink my teeth into Kid Icarus again. And so for me, it's like that first level is the one that's really iconic for me with the music and, and just the layout and everything. Uh, but it is a really cool game. And so if you've never played Kid Icarus, I would encourage people to try it. It's just an action platform game. It can be a little bit frustrating. The controls are a bit floaty, and so you have to get used to that. But it's got a really cool atmosphere. Um, I guess it takes place in sort of like ancient, you know, mythological ancient Greece, right? Wasn't Icarus... Wasn't Icarus the one with the wax wings and he flew too close to the sun and they melted and he died? I don't... I might be thinking of somebody else. But what's weird is that the game is called Kid Icarus and so we always thought that was the name of the character you played. But uh, it's not. The, the, the character's name is Pit. And to be honest, he's more reminiscent, in my opinion, of Cupid. Because he's a kid, and he's got little wings, and he's got a little bow and arrow. He seems like Cupid. Um, but anyway, uh, so the game's Kid Icarus. Uh, I'm really not sure what the premise of the game is. I don't remember, you know, back then. I know you had to fight Medusa was the big thing, but I don't remember why. It's got cool atmosphere. A lot of the enemies make absolutely no sense. As far as, like, well, if this game is in ancient Greece... Like, there are these, like... They look like some sort of weird cartoon, like Groucho Marx, or like the little eyeglasses with the nose and the mustache. It's, it's very out of place. Like, what does that have to do with ancient Greece? And there are plenty of examples of that. And like the Grim Reaper is, uh, is in there, which I mentioned in the last episode, talking about Garbage Pail Kids. Uh, there's this Grim Reaper that's just pacing back and forth, and then when, if he sees you, he like loses it. And, um, and, you know, I don't think the Grim Reaper has anything to do with, uh, with ancient Greece. So these, there's these weird, like, eggplant dudes. They walk around, they have these staffs, and they just throw eggplants. And if you get hit by an eggplant, you turn into an eggplant, except you still have, like, feet, but then you, you don't have a bar. You're just like an eggplant with, with, like, legs. Um, so it's bizarre. Like, the game is a little bit on the bizarre side, but in a good way, I think. I, I think it's a fun game. The graphics are good, the music is great. Like I said, the controls are a little bit floaty, but you just have to get used to them. But, um, you know, certainly it's not a game that I would ever be willing to part with, partially for the nostalgia of it, and just partially, like I said, it, it's, uh, I think it's a decent game. It's definitely one of the better games on the NES. And, you know, of course it was a first party game, and really I think there's no such thing. Uh, I was going to say there's no such thing as a bad first party game, but if you get back into the black box era, uh, there's, those early sports games are, are pretty bad. So, um, but yeah, but good game and, uh, not much else to say about it. I guess, like I said, I just, considering it was the first game I ever beat, I just, I wish I had more memories. And I think that was also part of the reason I was putting off making this episode is I'm just like, what am I going to say about Kid Icarus? It's weird. It's the first game I ever beat. And I don't, I feel like I don't have anything interesting to say about it, except that, you know, when I load it up, you know, the, the music that plays, you know, during the title screen, the music that plays in the first level. I have the nostalgia from that, but other than that, there's just so much of the game that I don't remember anymore. And there are so many other games we're going to talk about that I played at Jonathan's house that ha I have much stronger memories of that I kind of want to just move on and start talking about those. So, uh, so that's going to do it for talking about Kid Icarus. And that's going to do it, I guess, for this episode of Flashback. As I mentioned in uh, the last episode, I told you guys... I'd give you an episode this weekend so that next weekend we're going to have uh, the CGQ flashback Halloween spectacular. Um, it's not going to be spectacular, but I just want to talk about uh, Halloween was was maybe my favorite holiday when I was a kid. And um, and so I want to talk about about that and, and tell just some you know anecdotes or whatever from Halloweens of my childhood. And then we're going to talk about uh, sort of a spooky game that I was playing, or mostly watching Jonathan play, uh, over at his house around that time. So that should be pretty cool. So that's going to do it for this episode of Flashback. Uh, thank you again to Paul and Michael 
for their uh, generous and thoughtful donations to the show. And thank all of you for watching, and we'll see you next time. I want a giant screen TV. But I didn't want a giant screen taking over my living room. <laughs> Look what Zenith built. By remote control, the screen rises from the fine furniture cabinet. Zenith presents Space Screen 45, more than three times the area of a 25-inch screen, yet the picture is sharper than ever before in home projection TV. And only Zenith has the screen that disappears. So I get my living room back. New Space Screen 45. Only Zenith has it.